Aloha. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. It's Trump week. I'm Tim Apicello, your host. I'm here with Winston Welch, Stephanie Dalton, and Cynthia Sinclair. Aloha, everyone. Aloha, Tim. Uh, nice to see everyone. Well, again, a roller coaster week for Trump, and uh, particularly as it pertains to COVID-19. So let's let's talk about the uh, first topic of the day, and that is Donald Trump this week basically has taken a bold step to blame China for COVID-19. He wants to sidestep, in my opinion, the fact that he blew this thing off as far as his importance from the latter part of January all through uh, February and into the first couple of weeks of March. That was six precious weeks that we weren't attacking uh, COVID-19 and it has resulted in over a million, 1.1 million cases, and we're now up to close to 70,000 deaths. Uh, so, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo basically said he's seen evidence that would indicate that China um, had been, this, this, this COVID-19 virus somehow got out of the laboratory in Wuhan. Uh, but at the same time, when scientists have debunked that, saying that it was not manufactured. They've researched the, the gene trail on this and it was not manufactured. Uh, Pompeo didn't disagree with that. So uh, he's 180 degrees on, on thinking that it was manufactured in a, in, a, in, a, in a lab. And then at the same time saying he had no reason to disbelieve it wasn't manufactured in a lab, but it's a convenient scapegoat. And I suspect that's one of the reasons why Donald Trump is hanging on to this one. Uh, Winston, what are your thoughts about uh, Pompeo and Trump basically trying to deflect the, the last six weeks and put, pinning this on China all of a sudden? Oh, it, it, it's just anyone else is to blame uh, for, for any problem. Uh, you know, China, of course, hasn't been extremely forthcoming in whatever information that they may have had. But in any event, Anthony Fauci came out and said, there's no credence to this. Across the, the intelligence community, they said, there's no credence in this. This one has fallen flat and hard, but it doesn't matter. They will continue to pound this and look for any shreds of anything to, uh, to continue to promote it so that they don't have to accept any responsibility at all whatsoever. Shock of the week though, Mike Pence saying he should have worn a mask at the Mayo. I, almost fell over that someone actually took some responsibility in any tiny, simple way of saying, I might have done something differently. As simple as that, but I was shocked. Good point. Yeah, no, I caught me off guard too. And how rare is it that for any administrator under Trump's administration to take responsibility for not doing the right thing? Um, he, I think he realized the message he was sending, not only to his constituents, but to the country as a whole, as far as how we socially distance, and now the proper way to spread the, you know, to stop the spread of COVID-19. And I, I commend Mike Pence for that too. I, I think that was a good point you're making. Stephanie, what do you think about uh, the transference of responsibility from the Trump administration over to China and having uh, Secretary Mike, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Mike Pompeo um, be his mouthpiece on this point? Well, uh, obviously, to me, Pence is CYA, cover your butt, right? So um, we can admire him as a positive, you know, side to it, but he's CYA because he probably still has a career ahead of him. Um, so disappointed in Pompeo, continuously disappointed. Don't know what that's all about or how that serves him, his integrity, his, his future. A service to the nation. I, I just, I don't, I don't get what he's doing. He Let must me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Do you think there's a correlation of them suddenly trying to deflect to uh, China and the blame to China? Do you think there's a correlation with the fact that we, we, this week we heard about all the intelligent reports that Donald Trump received in January about the seriousness of COVID-19? Do you think uh, that had anything to play to it? Surely, Tim, I think that analysis is very insightful. Absolutely, that's continuously what they're doing, is, is deflecting and uh, the, the shiny object, let's go someplace else, let everybody worry about this big investigation into China, which is totally irrelevant now and unneeded. We need to be focusing on all of, all of the, the, the issues that we have. 
to, to take care of. So it, it, it's so frustrating and it's so transparent, but evidently people are going to go over there and spend their time worrying about that. There's decades to go to do this unfolding and unpacking and, and editing what all went on and, and having controversy on it. We don't. Right now, we need to be doing something else because one thing that just came up in the news I read actually this morning, it's about children from two until to 15, numerous of them, dozens, have been hospitalized. They don't know that it's COVID-19 yet, but they have symptoms that way. It may not be, but it's a huge red flag and it takes us back to the science of this and let's get on with the work, please. That's a good point. That's a very good point, Stephanie, because I think sometimes Trump's loyal followers ignore the science of, of this virus and they go to the politics of whatever their fearless leader says and does about it. And um, the fact that this now could affect their own children rather than a, a, a age classification of over 65, this may actually get their attention. So good point. Cynthia, what do you think about Donald Trump's attempts to uh, deflect this to China? And do you think there's any uh, sudden reason for it? Well, we know that China did um, hesitate in getting the word out to the rest of the world that they have this virus going on. But I don't believe, I, I believe um, Dr. Fauci, when he said there's no evidence that proves that or shows that. And so I go with the scientists and not the politicians. The politicians are saying that it was China and the scientists are saying that it wasn't. I don't listen to the politicians. I listen to the scientists. Good point. Well, I'm going to jump on my list of items to discuss, and that's going to take me down to Donald Trump um, had mentioned or, or had indicated that he was going to disband the COVID-19 task force. Um, there may be a lot of reasons for that. And I understand the update today is that he's, he's not going to do that. He's going to let it continue. Um, why do you think Donald Trump was actually playing with the idea of, 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 of dismantling the task force and the press briefings? Cynthia. Um, I think it's because he wants to keep the numbers low. He doesn't want people to be focused on the virus. He wants people to focus on the reopening and how everything's going to be so wonderful once we start to reopen. And he wanted to keep the focus on that. And let, me, let, me, let me throw this in. Do you think Dr. Dr. Fauci and Dr. Bricks were upstaging him? Yes. And, was and my, there was... Yep. Go ahead. That, the very next thing I was going to say is that I think he wanted to shut those guys up. And so by getting rid of the task force, he basically has shut them up. Well, if you remember a week and a half earlier, he retweeted um, a, a text about termination of Dr. Fauci. But I think that was very difficult because Dr. Fauci's uh, poll numbers of, of credibility and trustworthiness far exceeded Donald Trump's as it pertains to discussions of COVID-19 virus. Um, I think Donald Trump had a hard time figuring out how he could get him off the stage because he was more popular and more credible than our own fearless leader. Uh, so maybe this was a way for him to do it is just get rid of the show rather than the actor. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I think he was doing. Now, and there's others that speculated one of his possible motivations was to get the blame off of him when, these, when the death toll starts to exceed 60, 70, 80,000, that it's now going to deflect back to the governors of each state and he'll point the finger at them for the tragedy and loss of life. That was one of the ideas behind it. Or the fact that he wanted to de-emphasize um, the case numbers and the deaths and start emphasizing the, the, the ability to get the economy to rebound, therefore uh, better his chances for re-election. Uh, but if you could take the focus off the, the cases and the deaths, that would be a good thing for him. Right. Well, you know, I, I also think that um, they were directly contradictory in what he said. So Trump would say one thing and then Fauci and Dr. Birx would say another thing. So he was constantly being contradicted. So um, I think that was part of it, too. It wasn't yeah. just that they were more popular than him, but that they're saying the truth, and he's not, and he doesn't want to have anybody that's going to, you know, show his lies. Yeah. Hey, Winston, did you have any thoughts about why Donald Trump was going to get rid of uh, the task force meetings and press briefings? 
oh, the, the, the whole bleach thing was uh, a disaster. And I, I uh, encourage viewers to go look at Sarah Cooper on Twitter. She's a comedian uh, who just took his words verbatim. His, it's his voice and then her remixing it and saying, this is insane. But he had people in white coats behind him. And when you take it out and you say, okay, here's another person saying this is patently insane. And he got hit hard by this to the point where he shut it down as a new press lady who told us she wouldn't lie. <laughs> Why would you even say that? Of course, well, number one, of course, she's going to lie. Why? What, she's no use to the administration if she doesn't lie with everything. But, you know, I, I think it's, it's all about trying to control the narrative. And I, one of the important things here, I think he's losing Fox News. He's been critical of them again and again. He's jumping over to this one America network that maybe he'll take over. When you mentioned the word re reelected, I shuddered for a moment thinking it's such a nightmare to contemplate. But what really is interesting, Bush, Obama, both come up, real presidents, real leaders. We may have disagreed with certain policies on them. Obama is going to be giving a speech, NBC, ABC, Fox, and CBS going to have the uh, high school commemoration speech across the nation, all four networks simulcasting. That is important, and I'm sure the Donald must be spinning for losing Fox to Obama in a nationwide address, essentially. So uh, it's just an interesting time. When is that going to take place? Uh, I just read about it yesterday, and it's coming up soon. They're going to have other people, you know, performers and whatnot, but I think both uh, uh, President Obama and Michelle Obama are going to speak, but some other people as well. So I don't think... Uh, Trump was on the invite list. It would be interesting to see if he shoehorns himself in this. <laughs> All somehow. right. Stephanie, your thoughts about why Donald Trump might have been um, anxious to uh, end the task force? Um, well, first of all, um, I'm a former K-12 teacher, so all of this dog ate my homework stuff because he's not doing the work. is just so <laughs> transparent. And then the other thing that he's doing is contingency managing everything. If it isn't me, if it isn't my self-interest, then we don't play this. In other words, you don't get what you want. So it's not, oh, I'm not useful to this, this uh, presentation with Fauci and, and uh, Briggs. Then, well, you know, I'll drop back out and I'll go do some, some homework I should be doing <laughs> on this topic, uh, like some strategy, national federal strategy. No, no, no. It's like, oh, we're canceling the whole thing. Okay, you didn't like it, you didn't like it, doesn't matter. And it was me that doesn't- that I'm taking not, my ball home and we're not playing the game anymore. Not feedback for me, <laughs> precious feedback that can help me correct and get it right and then align with what's going on in this precious presentation, which I, I hear the polls say that the country does value the presentation. It, it, it just didn't get more specific about without, le with less Donald Trump. With less it. Donald Trump, that's right. So that's what he's managing. Everything is either him or it all goes away. It's his contingency management. Or okay, I want to talk about Donald Trump's definition of success as it pertains to tackling the COVID-19. And that is, if you remember earlier last week, Donald Trump was going on and on about how successful the administration will be if we could keep these deaths down to 50 or 60,000 deaths of U.S. citizens. Now that number has changed dramatically. Uh, we're, you know, we're way up above, above that. We're in the 70, going on to 80. And he acknowledged that recently with his uh, interview with Fox uh, in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And he, had he acknowledged that, yes, the numbers are climbing even higher. Um, but did you find it disturbing that um, he ties his success of, of the administration's handling of this virus to a death rate? So if the death rate goes to a quarter of a million, will he continue to say how successful the administration is on how they handled it? I think he will. It doesn't matter what number it is. He's going to say we were successful. Did you did you catch a sense of that this week? Who are you asking? Uh, that would be for um, that would be for Stephanie. Oh, oh yes. Um, that's another part of this uh, contingency management. You know, I am your reward. Okay, I am the reward, and everything I'm doing is really great, and everybody 
should value this. And if you don't value it somehow, then I pull everything, all of your toys, not only my ball, but I take everybody's ball off the court. Okay, this, remember the whole class had to stay in after school or doing recess instead of Jack, Jack Jones here, who was the problem. So anyway, yeah, so um, I'm appalled that it's okay uh, for him to do that and why we have no options, no no way to uh, give him that feedback uh, uh, other than the election. And that's just such a blunt instrument, literally. But how is it that we endure this? He's, I think we're just ignoring, we're using the ignore mechanism. Well, and I, I find it appalling. And I'm, I'm gonna jump to Cynthia on this one. I find it appalling. I think he's trying to desensitize um, the deaths of all our, 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 our Americans, and he's trying to desensitize it by just saying, no matter what the number is, um, we're successful. And I, I think it's appalling. I don't think he's taking recognition of the impact of the, the, the loss of all these lives. And I just think no matter what the number is, he's just trying to get, get right. public used to the fact that there's going to be deaths and there's going to be a lot more deaths. Cynthia, uh, excuse me, uh, Cynthia, what do you think about that? Well, you know, if you think back a little ways, he at one point said that it could be one to two million. So if, you know, if we've got anything under a million, then we're doing well. So 100,000, 200,000, he keeps changing his numbers so often that, you know, just this last week, he's changed his numbers three times. But if you go back about a month, he's changed them five or six times and not just in the way of saying, well, you know, I originally said 50,000, but now it's going to be more because we have some more cases and all of this. No, he, he actually started much higher. So that way, when he has a lower number, it makes it look like he did better. And I think it's appalling also that he would um, try to decide how well he did by, by how many people are dead. That's just awful to me. I agree. Winston, your thoughts? Uh, you know, we take no joy in having to go over Donald Trump and his missteps and just his behavior. It is appalling. It's sad. And, and none of us want to be, even be here doing this. But he is a brilliant um, self-promoter and strategist and he has hypnotized half this nation to believe anything that he wants them to believe they trust him more than fox news now which is saying something you asked about when that is that uh, graduate together is the the hashtag it's on the 16th of uh, oh, may so yeah. that'll be there and i you know it's it's important to realize there's a lot of other people stepping up and giving us hope and truth and reality breaks uh besides what we get from the administration and especially Donald Trump. So as the more that he becomes uh, marginalized in the types of messages that he's giving out to people, I think the healthier our nation is going to become because we're realizing we cannot rely on this administration to give us straight mm -hmm. facts, to shoot straightly, to, to advocate on behalf of all Americans. It just hasn't happened. So when we have others stepping up and even inside of the administration, when we have the, the Fauci's and the Birx's uh, stand up, that helps too. But as we regionalize and have uh, others, uh, you know, nonprofits and, and governors and mayors and whatnot stepping up and ordinary individuals, that is where we need to look for leadership right now. All righty. Let me change it up a little bit. Uh, by chance, did you happen to note the uh, interview that he gave in front of the Lincoln Memorial? And he basically, uh, for me, he played himself as the victim once again that it was. Abraham Lincoln did not receive the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune as he has with the media. Did you catch any of that? Uh, uh, this is for Winston. I, I didn't see that. I, I, I can't. It's astounding that, that he would compare himself to, well, he doesn't need to compare himself to anyone. He is in a class by himself and he just, and, and that's okay. Um, but comparing himself to Lincoln, I mean, come on. Well, no he comment. said he's been treated worse than any president and certainly worse than Abraham Lincoln. So I found that oh, to be. Been... <laughs> yeah, he's been treated worse than everybody put together in the entire history of the planet times 10 times 
infinity yes of course he is a, a victim of the first of the first order and um yeah he just deserves our praise and adulation okay i <laughs> well put <laughs> stephanie did you catch that and did you feel like he was playing the poor pity the poor pity pity me role as president um that's been picked on by the media and he can't catch a break from anybody did you did, did you get that sense from his comments um, I heard you say slings and arrows. He did. He also didn't get the bullet, and so <laughs> yeah, I true. really, really wondered if he knows if if his his knowledge of history gives him the full picture. Um, obviously, it doesn't give him the full picture, no matter that he might know the dramatic events and especially of Lincoln's demise, um, which was was horrific. But um, so no, we're 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 sorely missing in any form of leadership or competence or capacity. Evidently, even the capacity might not be there anymore. I guess with his age, but no, I I see absolutely no value or worth in these expressions that that he's providing us with and it, it is again just a matter of the um self self um indulgence and the self-interest and trying to get himself some point somehow with whoever it is that can can digest what he's mm -hmm. um, and um many of us are not you know, cynthia you know. a little bit later this week uh I don't know if you saw, but uh, George Bush put on a, he sponsored a beautiful video of, of how Americans should come together, unite, put aside our political differences, our cultural differences in order to combat this virus. And it was really well played. And um, like true and form, Donald Trump tweeted about it and basically stated that where was George Bush when he was being impeached? I found it appalling once again. I mean, you know, one one thing after another in the last week. I just my my jaw drops yet again. But uh, what were your thoughts about President Trump tweeting that he he didn't hear from George Bush during his impeachment, and therefore the value of his video was um, negated. It didn't mean anything to him. What do you think? Well, you know, it's just another example of how it is us and them. It is Democrats and Republicans. It's not Americans. He doesn't, he doesn't ever put things forward as we're doing this together as Americans. It's either you're, and if you're a Republican and you don't support him, then you're not really a Republican, you know, and it's basically the way he comes across. And I was never a big fan of George Bush. But by the same token, and I never in a million years would have thought that I would think he was eloquent by any stretch. But after this last little speech he gave, I, I gosh, that's eloquent in comparison to the what we hear out of our current president. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I think you're right. His, his, his disdain for any, any Democrat, and it particularly played out a little bit when Donald Trump said that Dr. Fauci was not going to testify in front of the House of Representatives because he blamed the Democrats of being enemies against him and, and basically was part a big part of why he was impeached. I didn't know he could prevent someone from testifying because they are Democrats. I would think that would be an executive privilege as a response to why someone may not testify in front of, of the, uh, the House of Representatives, not certainly because they are Democrats and he doesn't trust them any longer. Oh, I, I agree. <laughs> Know the law on that? I mean, that's a really good question, Tim. Is it, uh, that's his power? Does anybody know? Um, anybody? Uh, I don't believe he can get away with it, but that's what he stated as his rationale. And now uh, we know Dr. Fauci will testify in front of the Senate, but as a basis for preventing him from testifying in the House, I, I don't think he has that justification. That's just me, though. Yeah, I don't think he does either. I don't see how he could. That was my first question is how can he possibly say that he can't testify? I mean, I guess it's the National Institute of Health. So it's it's a government agency and maybe that's why, but it still yeah. seem right that he can do that. And I would like to hope that Fauci would just do it anyway. Yeah. Would you like to see him stand up and do what's right? Winston, do you think uh, Donald Trump has any basis to prevent Dr. Fett from testifying in front of that committee? You know, I, 
it's just astounding that he would even say that. But we have seen time and again, there are no norms, rules, laws that that are, are that are just ignored. That it, it doesn't matter. So the fact that he's open about it is well. It's at least it's honest, uh, if nothing else. And but but casting half of the nation as your enemy as enemies that is that's very dangerous we saw this play out in the michigan state house where you have people with their uzis essentially taking over houses of government which is insane and and having a president you know essentially saying there's good good people on both sides again I, this is a non a non argument that a president should never ever take and that's also an astounding thing that happened this last week that is still reverberating deeply in a lot of uh, our consciousness that, that says are we a, is this what we are now and we're well, having I think, a president or this? i think what what's happening is we're seeing so much so fast that we can't digest it all and you're right the fact that he called them good people on both sides they're carrying confederate flags swastikas they're you know they're their um, semi-automatic weapons. Um, I don't think that qualifies them to be stated as good people. I'll go with Hillary Clinton, and some of them were out and out deplorable. So, um, but yet Donald Trump uh, got got his words in edgewise, and again, that satisfies the people that are his loyal followers. So there you go. Uh, we're running out of time. I, Winston, where do we go from here? What's what's in store for us next week? Do you think? Oh, it's, it's like you said, it's so much. It's like trying to drink from a fire hose. And, you know, of course, as Americans, we support people's rights of free speech, the right to protest. If those folks have been out there with signs saying, liberate us. And, but the reality is, are, are we a nation of laws? Do we all have to obey the same laws when it says you have to have a mask to enter the store? Do some people not get to wear the mask because they don't feel like it? Um, I, I think that these are really fundamental questions that, Donald Trump has really unleashed. So we're going to see a lot more of that coming down the week um, and a lot more tough news, but we're going to see a lot of inspirational news too. So we got to look for what's positive as well as the destruction that's going on at the same time. All right, Winston. Thank you. Stephanie, real quick, what's in store for us next week? Oh, real quick. Okay. I think uh, I just want to say Cynthia, I think on the right track and that Donald Trump is ultimately the boss of the NIH as either commander in chief or whatever. And that's where Fauci works. So technically he can, you know, ask him as the boss to not do something. But this just shows us his lack of any strategy, nuance, or much, not even tactics. You know, he's just knee jerking and disallowing his, his performance before the, the house. And um, other people, I can't say that other people haven't done this sort of thing as a tactic to protect themselves or some issue, um, but they wouldn't have been as open and blatant about that. I'm going to keep this person from d testifying to the right. Congress. So anyway. All righty. We're almost out of time. I want to get Cynthia in here one last one last comment. Cynthia, real quick, what's in store for next week? Well, you know, we have a whistleblower that has come out just, just recently here at the end of this week. And I think that is a big step. And I think we're going to really start to hear more about this whistleblower. I think hopefully we're going to see more of an investigation into the IG that he fired um, because she spoke out against him and, and spoke out and said, we still don't have enough PPE. We still don't have enough medical supplies, so he fired her. And now he's trying to put in this other phony friend of his to run the, um, the, you know, the national stockpile. So I think those are the things that we're going to start seeing over this next week. All right. Thank you, Cynthia. Or, yes, thank you, Cynthia, for your, your comments about that. Winston, Stephanie, Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us at Trump Week. Let's come back together again next Wednesday at 11 o'clock for Trump Week. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.